All right, let's go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us here for today's webinar being hosted by Blue Label Labs and Amplitude. And of course the subject, how to increase engagement and subscriptions with data-driven app design. Uh, speaking today, you'll have myself, Ashkan Iskandari, Director of Client Solutions here at Blue Label, Tanya Junel, who's our Head of Innovation and Product, and of course, Jack Sneeringer, uh, who is the Solutions Partner Manager at Amplitude. Just some quick housekeeping items here. Um, the Zoom does have a built-in Q&A feature. Feel free to use that to submit any questions. If you're having any opportunities with that, feel free to use the chat functionality and we'll gladly answer that question towards the end. We will be having a live Q&A at the end of this webinar. And if anyone from your team wasn't able to join, you found something that um, what was quite interesting and you wanted to make sure you can revisit it later on, we will be emailing this recorded session to you all later on this week. So no worries there. And um, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in. So just a quick brief little rundown here in terms of what we do at Blue Label Labs. Uh, we are a digital agency based out of New York City and uh, clients come to us with a vision and it's our job to help turn that vision into a product that users will love and continue to use over and over again. Um, we've been a uh, remote since uh, we started the company uh, about 12 years ago. And um, overall, we don't just do design, we don't just do development. Um, we help our clients with a number of different services. And we start at the very, very beginning towards that strategy, that ideation phase, and then obviously from there, transition and development and anything that happens beyond development in terms of post-launch support and maintenance. And we'll speak to that more in just a few moments here. Uh, we've helped launch over 250 apps at this point, and quite a few of those have been award-winning. A little bit about our process and how we operate. Um, we start our clients with a strategy sprint to really help understand what the goals are for a project, not so much what the product will look like, what it's going to feel like, but ultimately what are the goals for this type of product? Um, who's the target audience, uh, the elevator pitch, if you will, a little bit more high level, make sure everyone's on the same page in terms of the direction for the product. Uh, from there, we transition into a design sprint, which is something that we've uh, reformatted to be a little bit more applicable for a digital product. I'm sure by now you've all heard of the um, famous sprint process that uh, GV introduced, and we've reformatted that that's in a way that essentially allows us to um, come out of of it with a solid understanding of what type of product we want to build. In this case, of course, a digital product, typically a mobile app or a website. Um, by the end of the design sprint, we will have done a good amount of prototyping, um, but then we transition into user research and beginning to understand what we're going to design. We never want to jump straight into designs until understanding what the target audience is looking for. Once we speak to the target audience, we have a great starting point. And then we begin to put together more visuals, more designs, and of course, continue speaking with the target audience, the potential users, and get their feedback. And based off of all the learnings and findings, we continue to iterate on those designs as we move into the development phase. Once we launch the product, we want to make sure we're listening to the user habits and the tendencies, what's the feedback. Um, and of course, taking a look at what the analytics is telling us, what the analytics are telling us, what's the data telling us. And from there, of course, continue user research and continue to iterate on the product in the hopes that we're able to retain more users and of course, increase usability within the product itself. Uh, just some of the um, projects of note here, uh, we were recently nominated for five Webby nominations. Uh, the Webby's of course, essentially being the Academy Awards of the tech industry, if you will. Um, Gretchen Rubin, uh, she's a five-time New York Times bestselling author. Uh, she worked with us to launch the Happier app and her app got nominated for the best visual design and best user interface, upkept by Consumer Reports, best user experience, uh, the Tide Laundromat, we worked with Procter & Gamble on that to help launch that app. And of course that was nominated for Connected Products and then Blue Social, which is a fantastic way to connect with people uh, without having to give out your business card, which is a little bit antiquated at this point. So just four great projects that we've worked on recently that were nominated for Webby's here in 2022. And our agenda for today, uh, we want to start with a quick overview of the current landscape in the media and entertainment sector. From there, we'll transition into defining the challenge that we're of course speaking of and, and the reason we're all gathered here today then identifying the various ways to address that challenge. And then for you all to be able to take away a checklist of different action items. And of course, after that, we will be having a Q&A session. So 
media and entertainment. Uh, just four of the clients that we've worked with in this space, uh, Time Magazine, we've been working with them over the past uh, eight months or so to design and develop their brand new mobile app. Uh, Bloomberg News, we worked with their internal team and helped uh, reshape and, and enhance and you know, essentially revamp their existing flagship mobile app. iHeartMedia, we worked with them to improve a number of their flagship mobile apps and consumer reports. They were looking to launch a first digital product in the space for homeowners specifically, um, which is called Upkept, and that was the product that we spoke about a few seconds ago that was actually nominated for Webby. Um, our experience with these four media brands specifically was one of the reasons we wanted to go ahead and have this webinar. Of course, with Amplitude, they've worked with a number of media brands as well um, that'll help speak to our methods, um, why we approach projects the way we do, I think we might have a frozen host. <laughs> Are you experiencing the same? Of course, okay. it's the personalization. Just something that continues to increase and improve. Um, Are you able to hear me still, Tanya? There was a little glitch where you froze. So maybe awesome. if you want to restart the slide, that'd be fine. Sure, sure, sure. apologies for that. Um, media, entertainment, landscape, uh, film, television, print, uh, there's just been such a massive growth over the past 18 to 24 months during the pandemic. And of course, the different types of channels that users have at their disposal when it comes to consuming the content in all these different mediums. Um, and the investment in the different strategies to retain users and increase revenue uh, has been significant over the past few years. And obviously this means there's more players in the space and we'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, some stats, uh, during COVID, um, the US saw roughly 6.5% increase year over year. And, and the sector is now looking at uh, 500 billion in value. Um, those figures were accompanied by a 35% churn rate on subscriptions, which is interesting, right? I'm sure you've all seen the, uh, the headlines that came out a couple of days ago. Uh, Netflix uh, lost 200,000 200, subscribers um, recently, and they're anticipating another 2 million. Um, they're beginning to crack down on people sharing the passwords. Um, and then actually just yesterday, CNN Plus announced that they're going to be ending their new streaming service that they launched less than a month ago. Um, so there's a lot of people entering the space, but obviously that means that the churn rate is going up. Uh, in a recent Salesforce survey, 70% of respondents said that connected processes are very important to winning and of course, keeping their business. And customers expect seamless handoffs between channels and contextualized content based on their previous interactions. And, and what does that mean exactly? Let's take um, YouTube, for example. If a friend of mine sends me um, soccer highlights uh, that I'm watching on the YouTube app, great. I can watch some of them and then maybe I pause it. I end up doing something else. I get pulled into a different app and I forget about it. But then I'm sitting down and I'm looking at my TV. I turn my smart TV on and I pull the YouTube app up. It's going to allow me to resume that video based off of exactly where I left it off previously. And then if I'm visiting YouTube again on my uh, MacBook, I'm able to pull up the videos that I've most recently consumed in the history section of YouTube. Um, but of course, it's going to be able to suggest and recommend different content based off of how I've interacted with the platform in the past. Essentially, the platform is, to me, acting in a way as if it knows me, it knows exactly what I'm looking for. And that context is very important based off of how I've previously behaved when using the app. And obviously, this is all about personalization. Companies that are using it advanced personalization report a $20 return for every $1 spent. That's impressive. 95% of companies that saw 3x ROI from their personalization efforts increased profitability in the year after their personalization efforts. So obviously, the numbers tell quite a telling story right there. ROI on UX. Happy users are engaged and more willing to pay for a great experience. And research from Forrester shows that on average, every dollar invested in UX brings 100 in return. And that is a ridiculous ROI. At the end of the day, 
when you look at apps like uh, Netflix, apps like a YouTube, um, they've set the bar very high in terms of what a good UX is. And now users have very high expectations when interacting with digital products that belong to other media brands, other platforms in the media and entertainment sector. And with that being said, I will pass things over to Tanya. Thanks, Ash. Um, so I'm Tanya Janelle, I'm head of innovation at Blue Label Labs, and I'd love to talk to you guys about uh, this common challenge that media and entertainment companies are dealing with at the current moment, um, but also about how this is an opportunity for emerging companies as well. Um, as Ash mentioned, we worked with Gretchen Rubin, who's um, just started her full-fledged media company, so it's going to go across podcasting. Uh, print and um, other types of media and having a little bit of an edge over other emerging um, niche, you know, influencer style media is going to be a very powerful tool as well. So not only just for large companies who are looking to optimize, but for emerging players who are looking for a little bit of an edge, a little bit of a deeper insight and a tool set in order to um, carve their space in the market. So. Um, all those stats that uh, Ash just went through is a fair reason to stress out. If you're a product stakeholder, if you are dealing with um, needing to meet your KPIs and you have just like all of these forces coming at you and you need to make a win for your business. Um, so the inner child in us might scream, pull out our hair, um, but I do have uh, a great pathway that we can take in order to, you know, get control of the situation. We've got a lot of tools that we can talk about, a lot of strategies. So, Ash, if we go to the next green, it's a little more positive. You've got this great, you know, mastery of the product space, the competition. You've got this. And our goal here with Lily Bloods is to sort of just do a little deep dive into what this is, what this challenge really is, help us frame it up so that we can take action. Um, so if you could go to the next slide. One thing that um, I think we could dive a little deeper into is this never ending risk of churn. So when you're dealing with a media company and you have so many different touch points um, and you understand that the individuals who are coming and and um, taking action at any of those touch points, that they've also got their own thing going on. They have other apps on their phone. They have other things to do. They have you know, places to be, and you are not the center of their universe. There's always going to be a risk that you will not hold their attention. They will discontinue the arrangement they have with you to pay you for services. And so you really have to work very hard in order to make sure that they're happy. And that, that's really the, the core of, of this um, problem. So users are going to have those, oh, sorry, if you could go back just a second. Um, users are going to have a lot of expectations too. So with digital transformation and a lot of legacy media, a lot of print, radio, um, moving into the digital world. Yet there are lots of examples of companies doing this extremely well. And then those who fail miserably, just Google UX for Forbes. No offense if anyone's here from Forbes, there are articles written about you. Uh, maybe um, a little investment in that area would be beneficial. That people talk if they have a bad experience. Word of mouth is a really huge factor in terms of um, you know, if, if you're getting feedback from NPS scores and stuff, that's great, but there's always going to be a buzz about a great user experience and that which is a negative user experience. Another thing that users um, are extremely uh, demanding about is personalization. Personalization space, especially for younger users, we're talking Gen Z, young millennials, they will not spend any time with a product that doesn't completely say, I know you, I know what you want. I'm gonna make this super efficient. I'm gonna serve you everything that you desire. If you're not meeting those wonderfully high demands, um, you're, you probably will suffer and uh, lose some of your, your attention. Another thing is um, the whole idea of having unmet needs. So 
you really have to understand what those needs are. What, what are your users' needs so that you can constantly meet them? Um, a couple of the big ones are, I need relevant. I need something relevant to me right now at this point in the day when I'm like stressed out or like when I'm ready to chill, I, I want what's relevant. So this is where you have to really fine tune your um, engagement and offerings. And also if you have an application, a digital application that is time consuming in this day and age, whether it's um, you know slow loading, any kind of metrics like that on the um, delivery mechanism side, you also um, will see that there will be a great deal of churn. So the challenge we're talking about today is how can we increase engagement and subscriptions in this uniquely complex, highly personalized media and entertainment experience? Um, you can see that We've already said this is an omni-channel uh, experience for most, as Ash was talking about, maybe you know, on your desktop with the YouTube soccer game or whatever, and then you're going into mobile. I also want to add in my household, there are four user profiles per you know, streaming service and things like that. I have shared accounts, I have there's a lot of complexity with these engagements that you don't typically see if just like a one-to-one a -one, uh, consumer relationship with a product on many apps out there. So this is a very complex thing for product stakeholders to wrap their heads around and hence that like screaming at the very beginning, the kids screaming, it's like a lot. And you, there's an awful lot of responsibility that comes with that as well. So what I wanted to do was to help us frame this for product people. So we deal with user stories every day. I almost created a JIRA ticket for this, but I figured you get the picture, you know, it doesn't need to be in JIRA, but this is a user story because we're users too, in a way. We are, we have our needs and we are a persona, product stakeholder. Okay, so um, let's put this in terms of a, a user story. So what are we looking to do? As the product leader, I want us to understand our users' behavior better than anyone else does so that we can deliver personalized experiences that make them pay and stay with our product offerings. Pretty simple. And I'd love to know at the end of this um, webinar what you think of that framing your own work goals as a user story, whether you think that that's even helpful or helps you sort of like frame things in a, in a way that um, helps you realize that you deserve to have your needs met. Um, so one of the really important things that I think we all need to understand as product stakeholders dealing with um, media and entertainment is that um, the key customer journey that we're gonna care about extends way beyond acquisition. So we might have clients coming to us at Blue Label and they're very worried about, you know, some very basic metrics like monthly active users, you know, cost per acquisition, that type of thing. But one of the important uh, takeaways from our experience and, and also something that's a tool for you is to understand that customer first companies are going to optimize the full experience. So you're going to go beyond that acquisition and you're going to think about that retention and you're going to um, almost act as like a generous host for anybody who's with your product over the lifetime. Um, and, and you'll see that not only would you be able to retain them, you're going to get that uh, brand loyalty and that gets shared through the word of mouth that I was talking about. So I'm going to hand it to Jack to talk a little bit about how Amplitude fits into this um, paradigm that we're talking about. Thank you so much. And yes, everybody, Jack Seringer, uh, Solutions Partner Manager here at Amplitude. Um, we've obviously been talking so much about just the importance of churn. And once people get to your product, how do you make sure that they stick around? Um, I, I think what's really important to highlight about Amplitude is really where we focus. So typical web and marketing analytics tools like Google Analytics or Adobe, they're really focused on this acquisition and conversion side of the funnel and don't really think about as much once they get to the product what are people doing that's just not really what they were built for uh and there's a lot of problems that come up when you try to use it for the product experience so 
we think that if you're only focusing on that acquisition and conversion, you're essentially filling a leaky bucket, but you really need an amplitude next next uh, action there, Ash. Where once people get to your product, you can understand what makes people stick around. How do we drive more retention? How do we drive more growth? As a media company, uh, you can't just measure subscriptions or renewals. You need to be able to measure deeper product behaviors that lead to uh, an indicator of success like retention or uh, conversion to a paid plan. And that's really where we focus at Amplitude. And we're doing this with a lot of different companies across the media space. Next slide. If anybody is curious to learn more about how we work with some of these companies, please feel free to reach out to me after this. Obviously, uh, a lot of these companies use Amplitude to understand what leads to engagement and stickiness. Uh, and, and how to increase that through messaging capabilities as well, which we'll talk about in a second. And then also understand the performance of content so that you can figure out uh, where you should be investing those dollars around content and what content is driving that stickiness. Uh, and then the biggest thing here is a lot of times media organizations like newspapers used to be free. They use Amplitude today a lot to understand what is that critical inflection milestone that we can use to drive users to pay for our subscription. So again, if anybody wants to learn more about these, please feel free to reach out to me. My email will be at the end of this presentation, um, but there's a lot more to talk about there um, just from the analytics side of things. Next slide. It's not just uh, our amplitude behavioral graph is designed in a way that really allows you to query against uh, disparate data points in a really fast manner. Uh, because of that, we have a really strong capability from the analytics side of things, obviously. Um, but some of our new capabilities around experimentation are able to adapt what we can use from the analytics side of things with the cohorts and test out different experiences using those cohorts. At the same time with our recommend package, you can personalize experiences on a one-to-one -one level based on how users have been behaving previously. So Amplitude is now op updated from just this analytics tool to a digital optimization system because of what you can do with our experimentation tool and recommendation tool, which has been incredibly popular within the media space, which has so much content that they could personalize to different users. So happy to talk more about that, but just wanted to provide a little connection to how Blue Label is using Amplitude today in, in the media space. Thanks, Jack, that's really helpful. Um, so one of the things that Amplitude, the power that Amplitude can give us is in identifying the most meaningful cohorts and accessing data around those cohorts super rapidly. So that behavioral analytics graph, the huge database that everything exists around um, from the app Amplitude um, provides us the tools to do um, you know, pull reports on the fly and run experiments extremely quickly. It also helps us um, segment our cohort so that we can run longer term programs um, in order to op uh, deliver an optimized customer experience to them. So if you go to the next slide, I sort of talk about what that means um, in the media and entertainment space. So Omnichannel, many different types of users, switching profiles, accessing from different devices. Um, there's even disparate properties that exist to, amongst uh, media companies. Um, there's bundled subscriptions, there's niche. So there's a lot of things to think about. Um, and each individual customer journey is incredibly important. So when you're looking at personalization specifically, you really cannot be lumping so many people into, uh, okay, they signed up here and we want to understand how many people um, have, you know, binge watched a series. Like we want to understand the individual on such a level that we can deliver the personalized experience. And how can you do that with ordinary analytics? It's very, very difficult. The behavioral analytics graph database allows us to pull minute 
um, actions and identify milestones in behavior that um, help us identify patterns of best behaviors, behaviors we want to see other users um, take in order to convert, in order to become a like, you know, a high value um, user of our brand. So we'll want to identify and analyze certain milestones that users are hitting, irre irrelevant of a time frame. Basically, we want to see if they've hit the milestone at all. And as you can see in this little diagram here, we might be looking at, okay, maybe we want to see someone who downloaded the app from campaign A and also clicked on something recommended and then watched a binge series. Those might be some milestones that we find interesting. Then we might look at someone who's coming in from campaign B and have they done those same actions. If they've turned into high value customers, those are going to be powerful milestones for us to look at and maybe push other users in order to, to nudge them to becoming high value customers. Gosh, next slide. So the behavioral analytics, uh, the powerful thing about that is they're very different from just, you know, hitting one event, tracking one event. You're gonna track one or two or three events in order to hit your KPIs. It's kind of like a siloed look at your product. Um, behavioral analytics look at the entire uh, customer behavior over time. So that, that helps you understand why they're doing a certain thing at a later point in time. So they might have had, you know, maybe they're responding very well to a notification or they're responding very well to a preview. These are things that you want to understand about that user and then continue to deliver accordingly. And any size company will benefit from this type of analysis. Um, so looking at the user behavior and identifying the milestones that matter. So you can see here, the highlighted in green could be a hypothetical uh, set of milestones that you're going to actually extract the user groups who have done those particular milestones. So you can understand um, when individuals are not taking those steps, how you can push them to take those steps if those milestones actually um, help you achieve the, the high value customer that you're looking for. And a lot of data analytics, especially, you know, Google Analytics and stuff, we're looking at Almanac customer journey tracking. So as I was mentioning, they're kind of like siloed, but they're, they're based on, you know, a discrete time period, uh, irregardless of like, you know, what's happened before then? Have they done this action? Have they not done this action during this discrete time period? And then Ash, if you can go to the next screen. But Amplitude helps us identify what actions help make or what we would consider an activated user. What actions we know get a user excited about the product and you've got their attention. So in this example, if they've watched a third video, regardless of when they signed up, you might have uh, someone who signed up and dropped off on a subscription and they came back again, they've been with you four months, but if they just get to that point of watching a third video, you know you've got them activated. And then you can take different actions accordingly to push them to becoming that valuable customer. So you can um, plan and, and identify those milestones with Amplitude and then create a strategy in order to move all customers towards that very valuable customer um, status. So this is just a visual, so you get it <laughs> in your head that this nudging is totally within your hands. So as you come up with your um, product strategy and optimization, you're going to be able to understand what will move a person and nudge them towards doing what you hope they will do in order to help you meet your KPIs and in order to help your business. So um, what, that could either be you know, to watch an additional set of videos or something that worked really well with other cohorts to move them to conversion, to you know, um, uh, upgrading their subscription, anything like that, you'll be able to understand because you have the data there that these things worked for others so we, want, we are going to attempt to push that towards these other cohorts. Another thing that 
we really love about data driven personalization and how we use it at Blue Label is that when you get the what, when, and how content is being consumed, it's going to inform what you're going to build next. And if you're constantly optimizing, you're thinking about this on the broader scale, you might be thinking about as large as new features but and content creation, like do I invest in this type of content or you know, different delivery mechanisms such as creating a, a new application. It could also come down to just simple recommendations and notifications, something as small as notifications. So all of this is going to inform those things that you can do to have an impact on the customer journey. And here in this example, um, you might know that the thing that has really worked for other users who convert to high value is that there was a, a special timing of a notification, say. And these users saw this notification after they did this. So you can force that change. You can deliberately say, okay, for this cohort who has not yet seen this notification, if as soon as they do this one thing, we're going to be able to push this in front of them. So you can plan your delivery mechanisms for different cohorts. And then to stress the continuous optimization part of this, um, at Blue Label Labs, you can go to the next slide. At Blue Label Labs, um, we already showed our process, usually starting with a strategy sprint, which helps everybody get um, aligned as to what they are hoping to achieve with whatever initiative that they come to us with. Um, we did one with Time Magazine, which had, um, I believe it was 30 participants from their side. And they, um, it was a, you know, completely cross departmental. Um, there were many different goals from each department. And by the end of the strategy sprint, everyone had aligned with, with um, consensus as to what they wanted to achieve. It was a very powerful tool in order to get, um, you know, especially like media companies who often have siloed editorial and then siloed digital and all that kind of stuff to come together with a plan of action and what they think the company needs um, in order to succeed. So once we've shipped a product, um, we work to understand the behaviors that um, the users are doing through our data analytics. And then we're going to take that seed of information and start planning optimization efforts, which are going to be folded into development. So we're going to get those insights, understand different cohorts, as I mentioned um, throughout this presentation. And then we're going to work with user uh, researchers and design in order to fine tune and craft even more powerful customer journeys, understand the granularity of like where certain notifications need to come up or where certain wording needs to change. Um, we do this through experimentation, a lot of um, uh, even ethnographic study that we do. We might do, um, you know, virtual user interviews. Um, we, we take a lot of steps in order to really understand what the analytics are telling us. So we consider that um, a, a very important partnership between the data and the user research. And that is what informs the development and then again shipping and learning so it's this continuous cycle and as i mentioned if you drop the ball you might you might be very sorry so investment in this type of constant optimization and this process um, is, is well worth it so for you um, i think if you aren't asking these questions right now these are really great starter questions um, especially you might have your own um, data system, you might even be looking at data from Firebase. If you're a smaller company, you might have just endless data that you don't know where to begin with. Um, so these are good starter questions, basically understanding, trying to understand what behaviors your users are doing that get them to that high value um, status for your company. So whether it's someone who's deeply engaged, whether it's someone who's actually paying you, someone who's upgrading, um, what are those behaviors? How can you understand them? Um, and then can you increase the number of high value customers? Well, you can say quite clearly, 
if you're using something like Amplitude and you're working in conjunction with user researchers and things like that and design with the mindset that you want to continuously optimize in order to do that, um, you know, I, th I think you're going to get the answer yes. <laughs> if you if you aren't doing that and you still need to increase the number of high value customers, this is something that you might want to start looking at and saying, um, what, what else can we do that? Um, another thing is that taking time to identify those milestone actions, like really critical milestone actions in your customer journey that you really need people to hit in order for um, them to convert to identify those and, and to really have a deep understanding of what those are. And then the action checklist. So as takeaway, um, I do want to say that our customers in media and entertainment usually start with a strategy sprint. Um, again, that's not only to help align, but it also to help, it helps guardrail against blind spots. There's a lot of stress testing of assumptions and ideas and the goal of a strategy sprint is to have a really clear pathway as to what your initiative is going to accomplish. So we found that very successful. Another thing is to implement amplitude tools that fit your needs. So depending on the size of your company, depending on how much you actually need to, um, to analyze and move, how large your user base is, how many do you have disparate products that you need to track consistently um, over time and across channels, all of these uh, will determine the type of tool that your company will need, tool set. Um, asking what valuable users are doing, and then identifying those key milestones um, and then optimize your offering to nudge users towards those milestones. And you should be able to have increased engagement and subscriptions, as long as you don't forget to continually do it and avoid the churn. Thank you, Daniel. And let's go ahead and uh, open it up to any uh, Q&A. Uh, anyone out there, we'd love to answer any of the questions that you have, any thoughts, any notes you have based off of the uh, items we just went over in today's webinar. Ashton and Tanya, if you were to, to think about, obviously, the, the situation going on with um with netflix today I, i'm curious like how, how much do you think that they should worry about churn like this is this something that you think is going to impact their business like from the news and media perspective uh curious what what your thoughts are on kind of how everything changed given that news i mean i have views on it uh regarding the younger audiences um, I think there's a bit of a attention deficit happening. Um, just the fact that there's so much user generated content, there's so mm -hmm. uh, many unique perspectives and views that are available via that, that if you want to find something that, uh, surprising or you can identify with, you can cycle through these things very quickly. Whereas something like Netflix is really an investment. You have to, you know, be prepared mm -hmm. to spend an hour of your time focused on one thing. And if you're slightly bored, you're, you know, it's just not going to do the trick. So that's where there's a lot of investment in that, um, you know, uh, unique content, uh, exclusive content, things like that. I think that it's going to need to do a good job um, embracing somehow these, these emerging uh, influencer type, I'm not sure how they would do it. Um, but that, that's mm -hmm. definitely something where they might say, you know, do we have to jump on the bandwagon a little bit and start getting, start communicating with the younger users? How are we going to do that? Um, do we need to have a different delivery mechanism? Uh, there's also other factors like 5G, uh, live events and things like that. Maybe they could tap into that as it becomes more, um, you know, viable. Curious, yeah, Ash, what you think? Yeah, I mean, I Netflix has um, done a really good job over the years of you know changing their 
their platform for the better. I mean, one example that I always love to go back to is uh, Netflix used to have a five-star rating system. Um, and they decided to change that to a thumbs up, thumbs down. And that's because they realized that, you know, putting the option of five stars in front of their consumers meant that uh, a smaller, a, low, a fewer um, number of people would actually give some type of a rating. Uh, so they change it to the thumbs up and thumbs down. And they realized that when users had just two options now to choose from, they were more likely to give some type of feedback. And that's why now you see that approval rating, which is just the basic thumbs up, 87% approval rating, whatever the case is. They've always done a good job of changing the platform itself um, based off of what's going to just be more receptive um, to the audience. But you're right in terms of content, um, you know, things have definitely changed uh, over the past two years. And there's just so many new names out there. I mean, Disney Plus and Paramount Plus are probably the two biggest ones that come to mind. Uh, and then in Paramount Plus's case, they're even showing live sports, uh, which is something that Netflix obviously hasn't really gotten into just yet. So there's obviously the content that they're showing. Um, and then there's that competition for, you know, these eyeballs that are now, you know, uh, looking elsewhere, and uh, it's going to be tough to try and pull them back in. And that influencer uh, type of demo, like you said, Tanya, is obviously a really tough nut to crack. Um, so I'm really interested to see um, what happens here in the next uh, next few months. And also, I'm, I'm curious to see how strict they're going to be about this password crackdown that everyone keeps talking about. I think that might yeah, be already... I have to say. <laughs> I think that might backfire. That might be one of the things that keeps people with Netflix families yeah mm -hmm. and you've already seen in their mobile app they have this thing called shorts so you're, you're kind of right in that they're going after that uh in between market instead of just a 30 minute show how do we get people in or obviously the quibi model didn't work as well but for that shorter bit of time alongside that longer time it doesn't really make sense for everybody to just watch a netflix show when they're uh sitting on the couch just relaxing for 15 minutes but yeah, I think you, that's definitely an interesting point. Yeah, they're also playing around with the idea of finally introducing um, an ad-based subscription model, uh, which they've obviously mm -hmm. tried to hold off on for a little while now. So that's something that they're now considering for obvious reasons.